the initial shot, I didn't even realize I was on fire as much as I was until I backed out and had noticed that my clothes had more or less melted off of me. I tried to head to the grassy spot to try to get myself extinguished and I collapsed and the feeling of knowing then that my flesh had split and fell off, it was actually hanging on my fingernails from my arms. When you're in the burn ward they don't let you see yourself and I wasn't, I wasn't aware of how severely my face was burnt. You know, that's something else that I was always looking at. I could always cover up everything else. And then until late, later in the stay in the hospital, I started to find out that, you know, I had disfiguring burns. And it took time. And like I said, I still today, 16 years later, have issues with that, being in public. One of the big issues I had with my children also is trying to get them to reaccept their dad. Uh, my oldest boy was five, and they finally let him come in to see me. And at that time, that was probably one of the harder times of the stay. Uh, the kids didn't recognize me as their dad at that time. I was worried about my relationship with my wife too also, you know, relationship starts with first uh, the, the physical appearance of it and that's now all gone from the relationship. Gratitude, you know, stuck with me through the whole ordeal. You know, every day she was there, but it meant a lot at that time, you know. Uh, the family deal kept me going, having her there every day. Today the Insider Exclusive goes behind the headlines in ignored safety, dangerous explosions, Richard Jameson's story. To examine how Bob Palkey, partner at Robert Palkey Law Group, successfully got justice for Richard by proving how this horrific gas explosion really happened, and more importantly, how it could have been prevented. Bob proved what was wrong with the equipment. He proved that the manufacturers liquid controls and black mirrors failures were on five specific issues. They failed to design and manufacture a safe product. They failed to test the product. They failed to know their customers. They failed to educate their customers. And they failed to warn their customers that there is anything unsafe or potentially dangerous about their product. In particular, liquid controls failed to put a sufficiently protective strainer on its meter. This meant that particles that could clog the meter could get through the protective strainer. But this case faced some real legal challenges and hurdles to overcome, like it was impossible to precisely replicate what happened since never in the history of this meter, nor the pump manufacturer, had there ever been a case such as this one. The defendants claim their products are not defective and this was not foreseeable. And defendants vigorously argued they are not the cause of the fire. In this Insider Exclusive Special Edition, we will show you that there are five basic responsibilities of every manufacturer. Design and manufacture a safe product, test the product in the lab and out in the field where it's actually going to be used, know your customers and how they are going to use the product, educate your customers on the safe use of your product, and most importantly, warn the customer if there is anything unsafe or potentially dangerous. Bob has earned a reputation as an unyielding country lawyer who repeatedly represents individuals and families against large corporations and repeatedly wins. And in Richard Jamison's case, Bob was able to successfully win an amazing $5 million judgment for Richard. Bob has earned the highest respect from citizens and lawyers alike as one of the best trial lawyers in Scotts Bluff, in Nebraska, and across the nation. He's a past president of the Nebraska Association of Trial Attorneys. Bob has built a substantial reputation nationwide by consistently winning cases other law firms have turned down, and his amazing courtroom skills and headline-grabbing success rate continue to provide his clients with the results they need and the results they deserve. Hi, I'm Steve Murphy, and this is the Insider Exclusive, live from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska, at the law offices of Robert Palkey Law Group.
It is my great pleasure to introduce Bob Polkey to the show. Welcome to the show, Bob. Thank you. Tell our audience a little bit about your legal practice. I'm a, a trial attorney and um, I represent only injured parties or families of injured parties or someone who's lost a loved one. That's primarily what I do every day. Today we're going to be talking about a case that focuses on Richard Jameson and the tremendous burns that he suffered as a result of a injury and a gas explosion. Um, tell our audience a little bit about who Richard is. Richard is a young man who grew up in Thedford, Nebraska. His father, more than 50 years before, started a business called Sand Hills Oil Company, which was a gas station and a bulk delivery to farmers and ranchers in the area. And Richard grew up in the business and since age five, he wanted to do what his father did. His goal, his dream was to take over the father's business. And tell us the facts of this case, basically. On a summer July day, July 16th, the Sunday, Alan Jameson, his father, was doing something he'd done many times before, changing out a meter on a delivery truck, a gas delivery truck. And he was ready to calibrate it, he had it installed, and he turns it on, and it won't work. It won't work, and so as a result, he shuts it off, he checks all of the usual suspects, all of the usual things, and rules them out one by one. And ultimately, he then uh, turns it back on, revs up the motor, and slows the motor down to see if it'll pump. It doesn't pump, and so what he does is he loosens slightly the plate on the meter at the back of the truck. Nothing happens for a minute and a half to four minutes. Nothing. Because he doesn't know it, but there's a vapor lock, cavitation, a cavity that doesn't allow gasoline to flow through. And then all of a sudden, there's a swoosh. And mists of gasoline is shot out that little hole, and suddenly, Richard is engulfed in flames. And he was burned over, I think, 75% of his body, right? 65 to 70% had second and third degree burns. In this case, what was your strategy to help get Richard the kind of justice that he needed because obviously the meter failed? Our first strategy was to find someone who had the expertise to figure this out. And we had the great good fortune to work with a fellow by the name of Dr. William Wines. And he was at the University of Nebraska, an engineer. He came out to Richard's place to the gas station at least a dozen times. He was kind of like Indiana Jones on a quest mm. and he tested this thing from stem to stern and ultimately he figured it out. And what he figured out is is that by using, when, they, when he took the meter apart, there was damage to the meter which indicated that the strainers had such big holes that they allowed debris to get through that then blocked this, the rotors from turning, so mm -hmm. it jammed. And we had a pump pumping against a jam system, a closed system, and that's what created the cavitation, the cavities in the fluid, and ultimately the vapor lock. Now, some of the challenges you had in this is, uh, in pursuing this case, is this had never happened before, had it? This product had never failed before, had it? We had not, we were not able to find from the defendants uh, or other research that this had ever happened before. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, they claimed, we claimed that it took the failures of two products, a pump that wouldn't pump and then all of a sudden would start pumping again without warning and this meter that had bad strainers, no warning and um, failed. And this could have been prevented with a pressure gauge, right? Our position was for a $15 fix Alan Jameson would have been able to use it like a stethoscope and see what the situation was inside the meter, mm -hmm. and he would have seen no pressure. Mm -hmm. What was the end result of the case? The end result of the case was an eight-day jury trial against two manufacturers, and uh, the jury came back uh, after a day of deliberations with a verdict for Richard Jameson. Of? 
$5 million. Now, whenever you have a, a verdict, you always poll the jury, I would assume, correct? Not always, but frequently we do. In this case, did you? In this case, we talked to a number of the jurors, and you know, I think that one of the critical factors was Dr. William Wines, who was you know, kind of like Sherlock Holmes, right. running up all the suspects and ruling them out, but also Richard. Richard uh, just had such integrity, and he was the guy that would not give up. Some of the issues that I found kind of ridiculous that the defense brought up as to why they shouldn't be responsible, and I'm sure the jury thought equally that they were kind of stupid, were what? Well, some of the issues they brought up was, you know, as you said, this had never happened before. Yeah. Why should we warn against something we don't know happens? Right. And our position was, and they admitted it, they had never tested in the real world. Mm -hmm. And the real world is the field of use. Where are you using? And not just in the lab, but in the real world. Mm -hmm. And in the jury selection, we talked to them at some length. Do you think a product should be trustworthy? It should be capable of trusting? And do you think it ought to be tested in the, in the field? Right. And every one of them, I mean, this is kind of their idea. Yeah. They gave me the idea that testing in the real world is big. Yeah, and, and education to the customer too, right? Yes. Looking for Train any them. potential problems and trying to help the customer so he doesn't get injured like this, right? Yeah, part of what a responsibility, part of the responsibility of a manufacturer is, okay, I made this product. I then need to identify hazards. Can this cause injury or death? And if it has, it needs to, by design, eliminate the hazard. If it can't eliminate, it must guard. Yeah. And the least it can do is warn and train. In this case, against this hazard, none of the above were done. Yeah, today we are fortunate to have Richard with us, and so we're gonna bring him on right now. It is my great pleasure to introduce Richard Jamison to the show. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thank you. Boy, you have gone through a lot, haven't you? Yeah. How many surgeries has it been? Oh, about 30 combined through there. 30? Yeah. Wow. Take us back to that day in, what was it, 1995? when the explosion happened. What were the thoughts running through your head then? Well, I was a young family at that time. Yeah. And the first thing, of course, I was concerned about my family as well. Yeah. Uh, with a family business, uh, you know, where my kids were, family, my wife, uh, my father, uh, he was also there at the same time. Yeah. Uh, at the time of the accident, my dad was on the left. Uh, my uncle was on my right side, uh, also a minor hurt. A uh, lot of uh, concern and confusion going on. A uh, lot of you know pain on my part with the fire happening. Yeah. Uh, my clothes were melting off me. Uh, you were burned on your face and all over your upper part of your body. And down my left leg, yeah. uh, front and back. The gasoline, the, the fuel was on you. That's, that's what actually started burning through yeah. my clothes. How did they extinguish? Did they roll you down on the ground or what? At that time, that's the first thing I thought is taught as a kid, yeah. stop, drop, and roll. Right. Uh, so I took off running. I was engulfed with fire all over my face and stuff. And I took off east of our location for a grassy area to just roll in. And I made it about halfway to that spot, and I collapsed on the concrete. And you were about, what, 24, 25 at 25 that time? years old. 25 that time. years old. And the next thing you remember is you're in a hospital. Pretty close. One of the hired men, actually, a guy came and took a bucket of water and dumped it on me. Yeah. The next traumatic issue was when my mom showed up there yeah. and seen me burnt. And, you know, I had lost my hide off me. It was hanging off my hands, actually. Yeah. And uh, trying to kind of regroup what's coming on, you know, ambulances. And they threw me on the flight for life helicopter. And the kind of next time I remember is we're in the burn ward in yeah. Lincoln. Now you were in the hospital initially for what, three months? Three months in the burn ward, yes. In the burn ward. And during this time, what were the doctors telling you? Uh, a lot of times this deal was, there's a lot of, uh, you know, they have you heavily sedated, yeah. trying to keep track of, you know, what's going on. I was still trying to figure out where I was, you know, even weeks later, uh, and what was going on. Yeah. Uh, did you know the extent of your injuries at that time? I knew my arms were severely burnt. Uh, they didn't ever let me see my face at that time. They did not. Did you ask them to see it? I did. And, and they wouldn't give you the 
a mirror or anything. Huh? No, no, it's it's a big turnaround in my life, and it, they were going you were bandaged a lot though, weren't you? Actually, the swelling uh -huh. is the reason a lot of it. You know, you retain a lot of fluid, and, and I right. was, you know, it was a tough time. Now, you had dreams ever since you were a little boy to take over your dad's business. And this, a lot of your future must have been going through your mind. What were your thoughts going through your mind at that time? I grew up with a little kid riding with my dad in the business. Yeah. That's all I wanted to do was, you know, be in the family business. Yeah. And the first thing I thought was that was all over. You know, where do I go from here? You know, there's... Uh, at that time, you know, I had no use of my hands, arms. Did you express these to some of your family members? Uh, these thoughts? With my wife a lot. Yeah, what did she say to you? You know, she was, uh, get through today first. Yeah. You know, it's... And even though that's 15 years ago, it's, I can still, it's very traumatic, right? Yes, it is. Tell us what has happened with you over the last 15 years. Well, I've been working at trying to adapt yeah you know uh, my life has changed quite a bit you know family has become even more prevalent for me you yeah. know I do have more kids now uh, I do spend a lot of time with them I realize that every minute with them I try to spend with them yes you know tell us your opinion of the legal system and how it worked for you well when we started out with them ideal uh, as you're aware, I came from very rural Nebraska, yeah. and to find somebody to represent me was a big step. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, there's not a lot of attorneys out in our area, and to find somebody that is our caliber to handle with what I was going to have to go through right. was a big step. How did you run into Bob? A friend, it's an attorney friend of mine, knew Bob. And yeah. Before that, I didn't know Bob, and he recommended him to me and met with him. Uh, I could see Bob was a very down-to-earth person, kind of like what I feel that I kind of am. Yeah. Uh, I was still needing some guidance. You yeah. know, I was still having issues. And that's one thing that Bob helped me out with a lot is getting me to the, where I could actually back to function in society again. Yeah, were you kind of, uh, I, for lack of a better term, disappointed with the other side's response to causing these injuries to you? They kind of... Well, I think they knew that I was a young man in rural Nebraska and had no assets of ability to get somebody to represent me on yeah. this kind of a case. Is this like they didn't care about you? Exactly. They didn't care about where it was and the technical capabilities of the case. I think they had this kind of, they were going to try to bluff me enough not to push the situation. When the verdict came in, five million, what were your thoughts? Relief. Finally, that, you happy? know. Happy? <laughs> happy, yeah. Uh, you know. A lot of crying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, kind of knew that you know my kids would be taken care of now. Yeah. You know, at that time I was still recovering pretty intense. Yeah. And I was glad that you know something would be there for them. You know, at all costs. So tell us about your life today. I'm, I'm enjoying it actually. Yeah. You know, kids You're are still in the business, aren't you? Yes. Yes. I've, I've changed our capacity. Uh, with a family business, that is one advantage I had is uh, was able to adapt my job more into office. I'm kind of a hands-on kind of guy, yeah. and my job has now changed to more management of individuals, trying to find people that would represent under you your standards and convey to your clients or customers what your feelings are. So your firm still goes out and tests the meters and... We service and ranch it. accounts and yeah. farm accounts, yes, and that's that's a big part of it, you know, and uh, the, the part I miss is the hands-on deal, but it's something you got to live with. Yeah. In this whole ex ordeal that you've gone through, what is the th one thought that comes to your mind about about gratefulness or about anything? The big thing I guess I express is, you know, family and, you know, getting to find somebody like Bob to represent it, you know, I felt that I, it was well taken care of, you mm -hmm. know. I had no worries. I had enough problem with trying to heal and that deal and Bob represented me and yeah. I knew he was taken care of. Bob mentioned to me that uh, they had made an offer to settle for, I think it was $3 million, correct? Ultimately. Yeah, and the verdict came in almost double that. And he said part of that had to do with you how the jury really connected with you. 
because you are salt of the earth. You know, you, this could happen to anybody, right? And one of the things is that for a period of time, Richard was stumbling and falling 30 and 40 times a day. Yeah. And every time Richard got up and I asked him in front of the jury about that and I said, in the future, when you fall, what do you plan on doing? And he said, I'm going to get up and keep yeah. trying. And uh, that's the kind of people I admire. Well, I want to thank you very much for spending your time with us today on the show. It means a lot to us, and I'm, I'm glad that it turned out the way it did. And, and uh, our best to you. Thank you. Bob, what a great client. Uh, I couldn't agree more. I mean, he is a man of character yeah. and courage. As a result of this case, do you know if the two manufacturers have changed their product to make it safer? I haven't followed them extensively, but it is my understanding that they have warnings that address some of the issues in this case. Okay, great outcome. That's what it's supposed to be all about. And I want to thank you very much for being on the program. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.